Welcome to Hollywood Graveyard, where we set out to remember and celebrate the lives of those who lived to entertain us, by visiting their final resting places. Today we conclude our tour of New York, in Westchester County, where we'll find such stars as Babe Ruth, Billy Burke, James Cagney, and many more. Join us, won't you? Hard to believe it, but we've reached the final stretch of our tour of New York. We'll continue to make our way through Westchester County at Kensico and Gate of Heaven cemeteries. If you haven't done so already, be sure to check out parts one through four. Just a few miles northeast of Ferncliff, where we left off part four, is Kensico Cemetery. This is a non-denominational cemetery founded in 1889 as part of the surge of rural cemeteries in New York after the Rural Cemetery Act was passed. It sits on close to 500 acres here in the beautiful Valhalla area. Let's make our way in from the southern entrance off Grasslands and head to section 93 northeast a ways. A short walk in leads us to the Iron Horse, legendary New York Yankee Lou Gehrig. He played Major League Baseball for the Yankees from 1923 until 1939 and remains one of the sport's greatest players. His nickname, the Iron Horse, comes from his record-setting streak of continuous games played, 2,130 a record that stood until 1995. He played first base and was one of the most dominant hitters in baseball with a career batting average of 340 and 493 total home runs. The Yankees won six World Series with Gehrig. In 1938 his performance began to slip, but more than just the effects of age. He voluntarily took himself off the Yankee lineup in 1939 and was soon after diagnosed with ALS, a neuromuscular disease now commonly known as Lou Gehrig's disease. The disease forced him to retire at 36, and two years later, it took his life. Today, I consider, I consider myself, myself the luckiest, the luckiest man, man on the face, on the of, the face earth. of the earth. Let's head to the next section northeast. Just north of the roundabout, near a statue, are the graves of husband and wife Flo Ziegfeld and Billy Burke. If you've watched many of our previous videos, you'll probably recall hearing the name Ziegfeld quite a bit. Here's the man himself. Florence Ziegfeld was a theatrical producer, known for his Ziegfeld Follies. Inspired by the Follies Berger of Paris, the Ziegfeld Follies were an annual series of elaborate and extravagant theatrical reviews that ran on Broadway from 1907 to 1931 with a few revivals thereafter. Some of Hollywood's biggest names would jumpstart their careers in the Follies. Comedians W.C. Fields and Ed Wynn were regular performers. Marilyn Miller and Fanny Bryce also rose to stardom on those spectacular stages. And then there were the legendary Ziegfeld Girls, the quintessential Jazz Age American beauty, who paraded before audiences in elaborate costumes. These were the chorus girls and showgirls in the Follies, as well as featured performers. Stars like Olive Thomas, Louise Brooks, Dolores Costello, and Billy Dove were Ziegfeld girls. Outside of the Follies, Ziegfeld produced other Broadway shows, including the hit Showboat. He died in 1932 at the age of 66. A fictionalized biopic was made about his life in 1936, The Great Ziegfeld, starring William Powell as Ziegfeld. The film won the Best Picture Oscar for that year. Ziegfeld is buried next to his wife, Billy Burke. She was an actress who caught the eye of Ziegfeld as she performed on Broadway in the 19-teens. They married in 1914. She found great success acting in silent films, beginning with the 1916 film Peggy, but by the 20s she began to focus more on stage acting. But after the stock market crash of 1929 and her husband's death in 1932, Billy returned to film to support herself. Her best known role of this period is perhaps as Glinda, the Good Witch of the North in The Wizard of Oz. I am a witch. 
I'm Glinda, the Witch of the North. You are? Oh, I beg your pardon, but I've never heard of a beautiful witch before. Only bad witches are ugly. She was nominated for an Oscar for her role in Merrily We Live, and is also remembered for her appearances in the Topper film series. Billy lived to be 85. This statue of a seated woman was dedicated by Billy Burke in honor of her mother, Blanche. The next section north is Uncas section. Here is the final resting place of Ayn Rand. She was a Russian-born author known for developing the objectivist philosophy. She achieved fame with her 1943 novel The Fountainhead, and in 1957 published her best-known work, her magnum opus, Atlas Shrugged. The book was eventually made into a multi-part film series beginning in 2011. A short distance east is the grave of Tommy Dorsey, a trombone player and popular band leader of the swing era. He was known as the sentimental gentleman of swing, for his mellow and smooth tone. No one could make the trombone sing quite like Tommy Dorsey. Early in life he played with his brother Jimmy, who played saxophone and clarinet. He then broke out on his own to lead one of the most popular bands in the 30s through the 50s. Among his hits are I'll Never Smile Again and his theme song, I'm getting sentimental over you, the first five notes of which are right here on his marker. Tommy died suddenly in his sleep at the age of 51. Continuing north, we make our way to Mineola Lake. Across the street to the east of the lake, we find the bench that marks the final resting place of Danny Kay, another of the entertainment world's all-around great talents who found success in nearly every facet of entertainment. He was known for his idiosyncratic performances and rapid-fire tongue twisters. Kay found success on Broadway in the 30s and 40s, including in the Moss Hart comedy Lady in the Dark. In the 40s and 50s he had a string of successful films, including The Secret Life of Walter Mitty, White Christmas, and The Court Jester. Many of his film roles were made memorable by his musical performances, including the song that is perhaps most closely associated with him, Inchworm, first performed in the 1952 film Hans Christian Andersen. Inchworm, inchworm, measuring the merry you and your arithmetic, you'll probably go far. He had his own radio show in the 40s, The Danny K Show, and in the 60s would host a popular variety show of the same name. The show won four Emmys and a Peabody Award. Danny K continued to sing, act, dance, and make audiences laugh until he died of heart failure at the age of 76. K is buried here with his wife, Sylvia Fine who was his creative partner. She would not only help manage her husband's career, but also wrote songs and music for many of his projects, including The Five Pennies and The Court Jester. She was nominated for two Oscars for her songs. Just north of here is the Friars Club section. Near the road is Soupy Sales. He was an early pioneer of children's television, known for his show Lunch with Soupy Sales, which ran from 1953 to 1966. The silly sketches on his show often ended with him getting a whipped cream pie to the face. He estimates that over the span of his career he and his guests took over 20,000 pies to the face. His high energy antics and rubber face performances made him one of the most popular performers among children in that era. One infamously improvised gag came on New Year's Day 1965 when he told all the kids to take dollars from their parents' wallets and send them to him. Many children did, and they received thousands of dollars. The gag got him suspended, but only increased the popularity of his show. Later in life he also made regular appearances as panelists on game shows like What's My Line and The $10,000 Pyramid. He died of cancer at the age of 83. Let's now turn west to the other side of the cemetery. Off the roundabout and Pocantico Avenue is the grave of Sergei Rachmaninoff. He was a Russian pianist and composer of the Romantic period. 
Among his best known works are Prelude in C sharp minor, and Piano Concerto No. 2. After the Russian Revolution he fled to the U.S. in 1918, where he continued to write and perform. One of his personal favorite works, and mine as well, was Vesper's The All-Night Vigil, the stunningly beautiful angelic choral work. He requested the fifth movement of this piece be performed at his funeral. As his health began to fail, he moved to California for the warmer weather, passing away in 1943 at the age of 69. Just west of here is a special section of the Actors Fund of America and National Vaudeville Association. Not all stars die wealthy, as fame can be fickle and fleeting. So these charities were established to help aging stars, even with funeral expenses. In this section we find Olive Deering. She played Miriam in two Cecil B. DeMille biblical epics, The Ten Commandments and Samson and Delilah. She was also frequently seen on television in the 50s and 60s, including on Suspense, Perry Mason, The Outer Limits, and Craft Theater. She died of cancer at the age of 67. Also here, further north past a tree, is Howard Smith. The heavyset character actor was known for roles as judges, police officers, or gruff corporate bigwigs. He had a role in Orson Welles' infamous radio production of War of the Worlds in 1938, and had roles in films like Death of a Salesman and Murder, Inc. On television, he made guest appearances on many of the great shows of the era from Bewitched to The Twilight Zone, and is known for playing Harvey on the sitcom Hazel. He died of a heart attack at the age of 74. Our last stop in Kensico is in the southwest corner of this same lawn, near the roundabout. Here is the final resting place of Anne Bancroft. She honed her skills as an actress at the Actors Studio under Lee Strasberg, and would go on to become one of the finest actresses of her generation. After a slow start in Hollywood, Anne focused on Broadway performances. She won a Tony for her role in The Miracle Worker, as the woman who teaches Helen Keller. She would appear in the 1962 film version of the play, which won her the Oscar. Having also won an Emmy, Anne Bancroft is one of only a handful of actors to have won an Oscar, Tony, and Emmy. Today though, she's perhaps best remembered for her role as Mrs. Robinson, the married woman who tries to seduce Dustin Hoffman in The Graduate. Mrs. Robinson, you're trying to seduce me. <laughs> Anne was married to legendary comedic filmmaker Mel Brooks, and would appear in a number of his films as well, including Dracula, Dead and Loving It. She died of cancer at the age of 73. Farewell, Kenziko. Next stop, Gate of Heaven. Gate of Heaven is a Catholic cemetery adjacent to Kenziko to the north. It was organized between 1916 and 1918. Like Kenziko, Gate of Heaven is surrounded by the beauty of nature. We're not in upstate New York but we're definitely no longer in the city. We'll begin our tour of Gate of Heaven in section 47, which is in the southeast portion of the cemetery. Close to the southwest intersection, we find the grave of Fred Allen. He's considered one of the most popular humorists of the golden age of radio. In his absurdist radio program, The Fred Allen Show, which ran from 1932 to 1949. Fred innovated radio comedy with topical humor, examining current events and presenting skits with recurring characters. And he's remembered for his long-standing mock feud with fellow radio comedian Jack Benny. After radio, he became a regular panelist on the game show What's My Line? 
He died of a heart attack at the age of 61. One section north of here, section 48, is where we find the final resting place of Bess Houdini. If you saw part two of our tour of New York, you'll recall our visit to legendary magician Harry Houdini. Bess was not only his wife, but also a performer and his stage assistant. After her husband's death, she worked to promote Houdini's memory and legacy. Additionally, because of Houdini's interest in and skepticism toward spiritualism, before he died he told his wife that after his death, if he could find a way to communicate with her, he would send her the secret message, Rosabelle Believe. Every year on Halloween, after Houdini's death, Bess held a seance, but never heard from Houdini. On the 10th anniversary of his death, she extinguished a candle she had kept burning beside a photo of Houdini since his death. The Houdini Shrine has burned for 10 years. I now reverently turn out the light. It is finished. Good night, Harry. Later she famously quipped, 10 years is long enough to wait for any man. Bess had intended to be buried with Harry after her death, in fact, her name was even placed on the marker, with the dates blocked out in anticipation of her death. But when the time came, her family, being Roman Catholic, did not want her buried in a Jewish cemetery. So she was laid to rest here, alone, at Gate of Heaven. Heading now to the western edge of the cemetery, in section 23, we find the grave of Dorothy Kilgallen. She began her career as a columnist, mostly writing show business news and gossip, but also politics and true crime. Her column, The Voice of Broadway, was eventually syndicated in over 140 newspapers. In the 1950s, she was often seen right alongside Fred Allen as a panelist on What's My Line, remaining on the show 15 years, until her death at the age of 52, of an apparent accidental overdose. In section two, north of here, just in from the road is the final resting place of actor Sal Mineo. He was one of the rising stars of the 50s and 60s. He dropped out of school as a child and joined a street gang, and after an arrest for robbery at the age of 10, was given two choices, juvenile detention or acting school. He chose the latter, and it wouldn't be long until he appeared on Broadway. He reached the peak of his success, playing Plato alongside James Dean in Rebel Without a Cause. His performance earned him an Academy Award nomination. Other memorable performances include the title role in the Gene Krupa story, and Exodus, which earned him another Oscar nomination. But like so many, this young talent's life was cut far too short, depriving the world of what might have been. While in Los Angeles rehearsing for a play, he was stabbed to death in a botched robbery attempt in an alley near the Sunset Strip. He was 37. Curving around to the northeast, we reach section 25. Up the hill a short ways is the unmistakable grave of the Sultan of Swat, the Bambino, or as most people know him, Babe Ruth. If it isn't evident from all the balls and bats surrounding his grave, he was one of the greatest baseball players in history, if not the greatest. He began as a left-handed pitcher for the Boston Red Sox, winning three World Series with the Sox. In an unprecedented move, the Red Sox sold Ruth to the Yankees in 1919 ushering in an 86-year World Series drought for the Red Sox, known to many as the Curse of the Bambino. With the Yankees, Babe Ruth became a megastar, an unparalleled hitter, winning four additional World Series with the team. By the end of his career, he had set countless records, many of which took decades to be broken, and some still stand. His 714 career home runs have only been surpassed by Hank Aaron and Barry Bonds. His charismatic personality made him a larger-than-life cultural figure off the field as well in the Roaring Twenties, becoming not just a sports hero, but an American hero. Babe Ruth retired from the game in 1935, and was one of the first five inaugural members of the Baseball Hall of Fame in 1936. He was diagnosed with cancer in 1946, and died two years later at the age of 53. Babe Ruth was portrayed by John Goodman in the 1992 film The Babe. Finally, for our last stop, not just of the day, but of our entire New York trip, we make our way up to one of the iconic landmarks of Gate of Heaven, past the lake, to the St. Francis of Assisi Mausoleum and Chapel, in the very northern end of the cemetery. There are no filters on this. 
This is actually how it looks here inside the St. Francis of Assisi Chapel. It's quite surreal. Fitting that our last stop on our tour of New York is an actor considered one of the greatest of Hollywood's golden age, James Cagney. Early in his career he was known for his tough guy gangster roles, shooting to stardom in the 1931 film The Public Enemy. Along with the likes of Edward G. Robinson, Humphrey Bogart, and George Raft, James Cagney would come to define the movie gangster. Come out and take it, you dirty yellow-bellied rat, or I'll give it to you through the door. <laughs> His role in Angels with Dirty Faces would earn him an Oscar nomination, and White Heat is considered one of the greatest gangster movies of all time. So after cementing himself as a gangster, audiences were surprised and delighted to discover that Cagney could sing and dance, quite adroitly at that. In 1942 he portrayed George M. Cohen in the biopic Yankee Doodle Dandy. The role earned him the Oscar, and is considered by many to have been his best. His final film role was in Ragtime in 1981. He died of a heart attack at the age of 86, and his eulogy was read by Ronald Reagan. The American Film Institute has ranked James Cagney number eight on their list of top male stars of the 20th century. And that concludes our tour of New York. What are some of your favorite memories of the stars we visited today? Share them in the comments below, and be sure to like, share, and subscribe for more famous grave tours. Thank you for watching. We'll see you back in LA. It's a bittersweet moment as the sun sets on us for the last time in New York. Our time here has been amazing, challenging, inspiring, and unforgettable. We're honored to have visited so many amazing people from history, and to have been able to share these moments with you. As we pack our bags and head back to LA, there are some people I'd like to acknowledge who made this trip possible. To Jason and everyone on Patreon and GoFundMe who helped fund this expedition, thank you. We never would have gotten here without you. To John who wrangled up some additional footage for us, thank you. And most of all, my good buddy Will, who was at my side every minute and every mile of this trip, sacrificing sleep, shins, and sanity to get us around to New York at a back-breaking pace, all without a hitch. Thank you, brother. Farewell, New York. Until next time, thanks for the memories and also for the pastrami.